Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of The Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry Podcast with me, Philip Eidson, and Darren McAnthony, chairman and co-owner of Peterborough United. Thanks, everybody, for joining us once again. Uh, Darren, I'll ask you the question that I always ask when we kick these things off. How was your weekend? Straight back down to earth, Philip, with a yep. fucking thud. I'll tell you, that's the beauty of football. You know, one minute I'm saying, my God, we're like, you know, stacked in talent. And the next minute it's like, I need to sign 11 new players. <laughs> that is the beauty about football. And um, obviously, welcome to you out in California. I'm still here in the UK. Can't wait to get home. As discussed, um, listen, you know me. I don't overreact when you lose a game. Um, I'm not going to bore everyone going into Saturday. Fucking brilliant, the fans who went there on Wednesday and Saturday. Um, we were we were crap. Um, you know, the players would all say that as well. Um, we were like way below our standards. Um, they probably outran us. It was probably similar to Man United, Brentford, and running statistics. You know what I mean? When you look at the stats after the game. So, you know, it backfired on us the whole um, uh, five days away. Um, it backfired big time. And, you know, and that's not an excuse, by the way. It's just I'd, I'd rather now we played on Tuesday, come home, players slept in our own beds because what's happened is we've ended up down there. Very difficult to get training facilities. We were training on concrete, you know, floor basically because the, the conditions and the, what the sun's doing to the, the place that did give us the opportunity to use their facilities. And the hotel that the staff, the players were staying in, didn't have air conditioning and the windows didn't open. Nice. And it's obviously the, yeah, like yeah, yeah, the hottest three days like of, of yeah. August. And um, not an excuse, we, we weren't at the races, but ideally, again, we didn't think in advance of that. Uh, and I'll take responsibility there. We should have had a hotel with air conditioning. I didn't realize hotels that have fucking air conditioning right. in places like that, which are kind of like holiday destinations at times. What the fuck? Welcome Give me my 12. Ones. Give me my 12 grand back. You've spent so, uh, Yeah, I know, I know, I know. So, but look, put all that to the side. At the end of the day, if you don't, if you don't run the hard yards, if you don't compete, I, I, I got the feeling within 10 minutes, it was like Plymouth were on a different level to us. Um, and, and they're a really good team, really well-run football club. I have to give them credit. You know, they, 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 they had a game plan. They, they played miles better than us. Um, I'm not saying they're on a different level from us. They were on the day. They know any other given day, you know, we're, we're two good teams. Um, so it was disappointing. I hate any game where the opposition goalkeeper has two saves to make the whole game. In saying that, Joel Randall's got an absolute super opportunity right after half time. Harrison's put him in. He's beaten three players. He scores that goal. It's on TV. Everyone gets off his back. The big fee. And he just, instead of just going left to right of the goalie low, smashed it straight down the middle at him. And you're like, Joel, need you here, bud. Need you. Need you. You know, we know you're super talented. Need you. And again, not digging out my players. I'm just saying what I say here, I would always say to them. And again, yes, it ruined my fucking weekend. I didn't watch any of the highlight shows, didn't read any of the newspapers. I've been hiding behind closed curtains with the air con on, the units I've got, building Lego, fucking, you know, irritated. Uh, and, and fair play to the manager. I mean, he said to me it was like um, a torturous trip back on the coach. He was like, it was like a morgue. So... And we spoke on Sunday. He's like my alarm clock call on a Sunday morning. He likes to like wake me at half eight. He's got young kids, of course. You know, we're out playing football. So we uh, we had a really good chat um, about things and about what happened. And, and he just turned around. He said, look, I can make this excuse. I'd make that excuse. Just going to say, the bad day at the office, you know, wasn't a good performance. It's going to take us a little bit of, of, of time to get right. You know, I'm not saying we're going to play like that all the time. But if people think it's plain sailing in League One, no. Because, you know, we go to, to Cheltenham, nearly get a bloody nose. We do get a bloody nose. Morecambe, yes, we won. We're in second and third gear. We're not great. Go to Plymouth. You're not winning a Plymouth in second or third gear. Okay? It's just not going to happen. Just like Plymouth won't win at say ours if they're in second gear and we're in fourth or fifth. You know, and they've got a good crowd. So that was that. That was the game. We move on. Um, and it's got to put. The positive thing from the trip was Wednesday night, cup win. A lot of our youngsters, a lot of academy players, really, really good for them. Great to win. Would I have taken the results reversed? Of course. Yeah. From a tactic perspective, does it sure it, does it have an impact playing the same team twice in four days? You know, are you afraid no. to show your tactics no. in the first no. game? No, no, no. It, it, but Plymouth made us seven changes on Wednesday. Okay. We made eight changes, and then come Saturday again. You know, no, tactically, our manager knows how Plymouth play. Plymouth know how we play the multiple formations we have. 
at the end of the day, you can go on about tactics all you want, but when it comes down to 11 v 11, if you don't win 50 50s, if your wing backs don't try and beat a man and give up after losing the first battle, if you're attacking players, don't try a leg. You know, if you don't take your chances, you lose a game of football. And if you do it against a team with 14,000 fans, you know, at their, at their home, at their place, and you, you, you're at a five level, which a lot of our players were at fives and sixes, you're not winning. You're not winning the game. I'm sorry. That, that's, I don't care if you're in the championship or if you're in League One. I've always said this. Sometimes in League One, you can get away with two or three of your players being at a five. What you can't do is get away with eight or nine. The goalie's probably the only guy who came out with credit. And I don't want Alan Swan hearing this and just write headlines. And Yeah, we're playing Wednesday tomorrow night. I, I just don't want to exasperate you know, headlines. I'm not digging out the team. I'm saying what they would all say themselves, because they are honest. Um, we weren't at the races. And fair play to Plymouth. They, they, they took advantage of that and they did the business. You know, I know we talked about him uh, after the Markham game that I went to, but one of those saves that your keeper made that I saw in the highlights, it was like Peter Schmeichel all, all over again. Like, he makes himself so big. Um, he's, he, he's a terrific young goalie. To be fair, he was the only, he was the only one with serious credit on Saturday. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, four for, for him, it could have been four or five now. Um, yeah, you know, he's only going to get better. He's going to make mistakes, but he's going to get better. And he's a proper, proper, proper young, good goalkeeper. So, again, let's put that to the side. You know, the people in front of them need to do their jobs and make them less busy. <laughs> um, now, you talked about beating Plymouth in the show. Uh, sure. You now have uh, the Steve Evans derby yeah, for, uh, <laughs> for the second round. And I don't say, oh, geez, because it's Steve. It's just like we're already playing Steve this week before. And the football gods haven't been kind. I don't know who's rigged the fixtures. You know, if you look at all our, if you looked at our fixture list, away first, away at Christmas, away last, I think the top eight, nine teams in the league we play away. Like, we've now got, I think, away from home, who have we got? We've got Derby, Bolton, and there's someone else in there that's like a promotion rival that we're playing back-to-back. Oh, Portsmouth, away from home, coupled with Plymouth, who were seventh last year. And then you get the Cup, Plymouth away in the draw, and now you got, again, another away draw. And it's like, come on, cut us some slack here because, you know, listen, okay, you get runs where you have to go. But, I mean, that's too much. So, yes, we're playing Stevens twice. Obviously, the EFL Cup and the EFL Trophy. Um, look, great. I, the manager's decision to go with younger players, I'm okay with that. I couldn't care about the League Cup. Yes, we'd like to win the EFL Trophy. I'll care about the League Cup if we get to the stage where Liverpool or Man United right. are in the draw. We're gonna make then money. financially, I care. Because right now, I think we made five grand in prize money yeah. the other night, which doesn't cover the cost yeah. of the trip there. Prize money in the League Cup is basically zero, isn't it? Even if you go to the final, it's like 100,000. The only way you're making money is if you get drawn against United or Liverpool, you get 150 grand for TV, you get half the gate, which you get you half a million. That's the only way. You get to the semi final, then you make serious money. I think it's still two legs. So, yeah. again, you know, there you go. A bit like Bradford years ago. Yeah, so. I mean, we made a vote. It was 10 years ago now, which is crazy to think about. But Millions. You made millions. Uh, yeah. But, but, you know, not until we made fortunes because it wasn't, we didn't make the money playing away at Watford or away at Notts County or at home mm. to Burton. You know, it was only when you get to Arsenal, two legs versus Villa and then the final. Big um, ones. That's know, it. That was, that was where all the money came in and then being on TV. Yeah, and the only good thing about Stevenage is it's not that far for our fans to travel. And yeah. um, again, for our team, it ain't that far to travel. And it's halfway from me, between, it's between Peterborough and me. So again, there's your positives. And, uh, you know, yeah, it is what it is. Fuck it. So it one, one step closer to us playing each other in the third round. To be fair, I watched the Bradford game on TV last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed the build-up. Uh, Paul Hughes came across. I don't think you'd have seen that in Sky. Uh, he came across really well. I think you were flying at the time, or you were flying the day before. But um, yeah, I got. Uh, I was in the dentist chair while it was going on. So right, was, fair I enough. Text messages while I was in the dentist chair, and uh, right, fair play, you know, fair play. Watched back some of it when I got home. I didn't see all of it. Yeah, really good performance. It made me nearly want to pick up the phone and buy Andy Cook, mm-hmm. but I didn't look at his age. <laughs> He's not, it was that good, you know. So I kind of knew seeing that performance it was what you needed to get going. Hence, you won yeah. on Saturday. So you, you, you know, as I've said. I like what I'm seeing, you know, and uh, yeah, I'm sure you watched the game on Saturday. Was it a comfortable win? Yeah, it was one of those where um, it was much like when you played Markham. It was, right. we never really felt like we got out of second or third gear. Sure. Um, you know, I think that if we would have been greedy, um, we should have pressed and got more. You know, they okay. were down to 10 men. It was hot. They'd made, they had two uh, muscle injuries in the first half where they had to make subs. 
Sure. So, you know, they were depleted come half time. And, yeah. you know, with the weather, what it was, I mean, I'm sure they were all drained. So there was probably an opportunity to really um, put the foot down. And um, I, don't, I think Mark Hi. Hughes wasn't too happy that they didn't do that. But a win is a High win. standards. High yeah. standards. Listen, two wins in a week. Cup, yep. home, both home games. Excellent. You know, it's what we've got to do now. We've got, obviously, Wednesday, tomorrow night. We've got Lincoln and Saturday. You know, two teams are going to be up there, you'd expect. We have to do the business at home. You want to get promoted from this league, you have to be good at home. So yeah. that's it. That's the no, it was a good, a good, you know, we look back, it was a good week, hopefully, with a week that kicks things off again. And then we've got Colchester tomorrow, uh, Tuesday okay. as we record this away, and then Hartley Pool away on Saturday. That's a lot of yards as well. Not for yeah. you, really, is it? Miles Wise, Hartley I mean, It's still, still a schlep. It's still a fair, um, fair journey up to Hartley Pool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, listen, so, you know, doing a podcast about football. I'm not really in the mood to talk about football. Hopefully Liverpool tonight will uh, cheer me up. And no, my fucking luck, they'll probably get battered as well. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, my God, I'm But uh, who, yeah. Who have they got tonight? Uh, Crystal Palace at home at Anfield. Okay. So, you, you know, you'd like to think, hey, Arsenal doing well. I was right, wasn't I? I told them, not ready to I, win a title yet, but they're getting there. I watched the first two episodes of the Amazon Prime series last night. It's good, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so looking forward to catching some more yeah. while I'm out here he, this week. It comes across really well, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, Yeah, my missus has watched all six so far. She's really into it, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I really like it. You know, I think uh, Arteta, Edu, I think they've got a good thing going on there. And uh, like I said, I think in the next 24 months, they'll be vying for the title. More than any other team there, I can see, obviously outside of Chelsea, Liverpool and uh, Man City, I think Arsenal are the ones that are going to make that next big step. Everyone says Tottenham, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think Arsenal definitely the next couple of years for a title run. Um, and just kind of wrapping up for for City, we've got Black, Blackburn in the next round. So we've, Sammy. You've, you've got your Steve uh, Evans derby. We've got our Mark Hughes derby. Yes. Um, you won it on TV. I saw you. I saw you uh, pushing. Unfortunately, not this time. I guess we'll uh, can't be greedy. Um, the you other don't thing- care about it, do you? Unless you get a few quid from TV, that's the only reason you care. You want to get promoted from League Two. Yeah. You know, that's that's the only priority. The cup matter. Like, we winning against Hull gave us the budget to be able to do something with some, uh, retain some players in the squad, uh, especially because of TV money that yeah. we budgeted to have to leave because of the investment we've made in the squad. So, there you, go. you know, that worked. Um, but TV is really all we want, I think. Um, there you go. And then another one uh, which I wanted to bring up was Reece Staunton. So we've talked about Reece Staunton before on the pod. Um, I know that you've actually um, you know, looked at Reece in the past, probably a couple of years ago. So yeah. he moved on a permanent to Bradford Park Avenue, um, which is it's, real it's a lesson for a young kid. Yeah, it's a lesson with young players, you know, that you know, if they're not at it all of the time, if they're not you know, mentally strong, if they're not physically strong, if, if they don't take the game seriously, if they don't have the right arm, I'm not saying – this applies to him, by the way, because I don't know enough about his situation. But two years ago, a lot of clubs looking at him to suddenly he's now dropped into non-league. Again, it's it, and it's not the end for him. Hopefully he can come again. But again, it's a message to young players. It's not so easy out there. Just because you can break on the scene, you have to keep keep up. You know, you, you've got to go to levels you've never been before. Mm. You know, and there's a fine line in quality between uh, National League North and, you know, League One, the championship. How much of it is in the, in the head? Correct. You know, Absolutely. The, Loads of it. Loads of it psychological. I mean, young people. I was only saying this to my missus yesterday. I had some 18-year-old or whatever having a go at me on Twitter on Sunday. And I was saying to my missus, this is what's wrong with the world right now. With all the woke and the fucking nonsense and the shite and these gobshites and harrods who are throwing milk on the floor because they're worried about dairy and climate. And these idiots who are tying themselves to goalposts, going on the road because the planet's fucking ending in 12 years and all the usual climate fucking activist nonsense which you probably love because you're in california but these young people these most of them are middle class spoiled fucking rich kids who've been brought up by shit parents and i'll say that again shit parents if my son who's 17 was on twitter abusing the owner of a sports franchise i'd smack him silly now literally he gets smacked silly but i'll tell you why he wouldn't be on there doing that because i fucking brought him up better and the fact these parents you see these kids out there who were in their late teens, acting like this, acting entitled, acting like our little bastards, yeah, the way they act, is reflective of the shoddy and shit job their parents have done. And that is the truth. And that is where I've said to you, this generation suck that we've seen now with all of these wokeists is because of the shoddy parenting. So if you're listening out there, parents, and you've got kids who are 12, 13, 14, getting into that stage, do your fucking job. Because your job 
yeah, is to bring the next generation into the world that aren't like these gobshites that we've currently got. There you go. Rant yeah. over. You know, we had someone who threw Pyro in the cop at City in the top. Oh, oh was he? Cop. Well, they haven't put out who he is, but, you know, it's probably, you know, late teens, I would imagine, because that seems Again. to be who has all these Again. pyros. Again. And it hit another spot on the lower end of the cop, oh. like a five-year-old oh. girl at like a second. Oh, day. God. I mean, it's just like, so mindless. Uh, uh, I. Honestly, that's horrible. I hope the kid's okay. That's she is, disgusting. Uh, I mean, and I, I hope mentally, someone gave that, that, think, uh, but... somebody give that guy a good hiding who did that. Mm-hmm. Because if I found him, it was my kid. I'll tell you what, he'd limp for life. But, you know, I'm watching this 18-year-old at me about this, about that. And I just said, read, read his Twitter. There's never a positive comment. Yeah. It's just negative, negative, negative. And I'm thinking to my own son, my seven, he would never dare be so disrespectful so then I'm patting myself on the back and my wife, more my wife than me, like, that's parenting. Yeah. These fucking little gobshites, who the fuck they think they are. I don't care if they've got two parents, one parent, whatever they are. Gobshites. And that is the fault of the parents. Mm-hmm. And not enough parents take that responsibility when they should. Now, did you see the um, uh, Darren Ferguson article this week in Coach's Voice? I did. What did you make of that? Well, funny enough, I was with the gaffer uh, two weeks ago. We met up the first time I've heard from him since the day I was in the shower when he resigned. So you thought, this is the gaffer. He'll pop up a year, 60. You know, he won't want to talk to you before that, but he reached out to me. I was like, Chairman, can we grab lunch? So we went at lunch at uh, the Haycock down near Peterborough and caught up for about three hours. And of course, you know, he would say to me at the time, he's probably a little bit more blaming towards my partners. And I said to him, look, all three partners are the same. So I said, if you're blaming them, you're blaming me. As much as we have a good relationship, so you can't do that. Um, and I saw his article. I liked the article. I didn't like the lack of investment bit in the article because we were one of the highest outside teams that are big clubs. We were one of the highest spenders. Now, you can agree or disagree whether the recruitment was right, whether it was wrong. He stood behind all the recruitment. He was part of those recruitment meetings. And um, Would we have liked to have had more money? Sure, but we, we weren't in a position. You know, We're coming out of a pandemic. We... You know, we couldn't go out and spend 10 grand a week on, on players. And the reality is, if we had signed three players on 10 grand a week, we didn't stay up, we'd have them in League One. Because none of those players would take a relegation release for us, you know, uh, on wages, you know, that kind of ilk. So suddenly, you're going into League One, and we're in trouble. I wouldn't be able to sign any of the five players we have right now that makes us stronger in League One. And we'd be treading water in League One with some heavy hitters costing us, making us bleed. So I, I get his frustration. I understand that. Um, I think he needs to look at himself a bit more. You know, I think he has to share in, in, in collectively that, you know, we weren't good. And that includes him. Uh, and that includes his staff. Yeah. And I think if, if he could be right about anything, and I said this when I met him, he could have demanded more staff-wise as regards we back him for better staff, maybe. Not a suspect that the staff he had. But maybe better staff in sports science and this and whatever. Grants demanding like that. Maybe Darren needs to do that. Um, because did we work hard enough last preseason? No. Did we work hard enough the first few months? No. Too many days off. Too many, Yeah. And he is still also looking the mirror over that because he was in charge. So this isn't a tit for tat. I will speak to him now about it. But I, I you know, to be said, well, lack of investment, da 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 da. I get it. You know what I mean? We all failed. He failed. I failed. Um, we got relegated as a result of it. Um, so he has to move on now. We have to move on. Yeah, we still speak. You know, we spoke again the other day. He emailed me and said, oh, "I'm out looking at games," uh, and he was like, "Is there anyone out there that you're watching and you want me to cast my eye over?" Because he wants mm-hmm. to be busy, and I told him yeah. to be busy. Um, and that's the way it is. So again, Alan Swan, listening. Don't try and write articles to create a division between me and Darren. It's not what I'm saying on the podcast. I'm just giving my interpretation, like he's given his, and he's entitled to his opinion. By the way, probably still feels a bit raw. And, uh, you, you know, and, and the biggest question mark over Darren's whole career is, can he stay in the championship? And that's the one that's irritating him, the life out of him. So I hope he gets there and stays there and puts that to bed. Yeah, and he has to set the narrative to hopefully get him in a position to take that next job as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, he'll definitely look. He'll definitely get the next job. If one of the big jobs come up in League One, um, you know, and the, the trigger is pulled in November, there's no better man to try and get in because he's won promotion from League One so many times. Um, you know, but it's great because, you know, we're going to remain friends and now I just want nothing but the best for him. Right. You know, and I, you know, I said to him, I thought he took too long getting back in. He should have been back in in June. 
that he wanted to take an extended break. So now he's going to wait for November, and that's not always ideal. So, but you know, I, I have nothing but love and respect for him, wishing the best. But good article. Yeah. Well, let's uh, just have a look around the leagues because I've got a bunch of sure. questions as well to ask you later. That yeah. For the, uh, the past week or so. So uh, I guess let's start with uh, what was the most present, which was Chelsea and Spurs. Oh, I love that game. <laughs> the shenanigans game. between the coaches. Well, I don't. I don't know what was it. Graham Souness has got hammered by the woke brigade. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, you know, obviously he's on woke sports yesterday and, and um, he's got absolutely hammered. Uh, he said something like, this is what the men's game is all about or, you know, men being men or blah, 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 blah. And it's like the whole woke fucking police are out. And, uh, women's football, and it's just like fucking and we're watching men play. Can we fucking have a day off from all the woke shit? Of speech that- like, like, you know, he's a 70-year-old man. Am I giving him a free pass? Yeah, I fucking am. Like, he doesn't care and that's what I like about him. He doesn't give a shit. Do we have to do better in the younger generations? Yes. But you know what? I like the fact he talks the way he does. And uh, I have no problem with anything he said. And I think anyone with any common sense who doesn't want to give it the usual woke headlines. And, you know, I saw like a load of football sites giving it the big ones. He was next to, obviously, a female English player when he said it and trying to create. Yeah. It's the woke police. I'm fucking fed up with them all. At the end of the day, that was a fucking brilliant game. Whether it was men playing, whether it was women playing, whether it was they, them playing, whoever the fuck was playing. That was a great game of football. It was physical. It was aggressive. It was goals. The two managers trying to beat seven bells of shit out of each other. I, I had to ring my missus in America and say, turn your TV on. I said, you're going to love this, like Conte and fucking uh, um, Tuchel. I mean, it, it was, it was, yeah, enjoyed that. That's what Premier League's all about. Love it. Now, what if it was your manager doing that? Oh, I love it. I have no problem with that. Mm. Now, listen, every, every match, I have a problem. Yeah. Big matches, no problem. We all get worked up. We all have passion. It's nice to see it. You see some managers who've got no passion. They've got nothing in them. Sometimes your team need to see that you care more than them if they're not doing well at the time. You know, it's funny you say that. I was I mentioned a couple of weeks ago listening to the the BBC Sounds pod that's following um, Carl Robinson and Paul Warren from last season. And mm-hmm. one of the things that Carl Robinson said was, you know, I, I'll do anything to try and win. And if that means manufacturing situations that, you know, show my team that they need to put a bit of passion in, if I get myself sent off, if I, ha- I end up having an argument with somebody, whatever it takes, I'll do whatever it takes. You would. You would. You'd like, you know, I'm, <laughs> of course you would. Most people would. Most people would blow a stranger on the highway to get promoted. You know, let, let's be honest here. You know, at the end of the day, this is, yes, it's a game. Yes, it's a sport, but it's everything. It's everything. And it's the same for managers. You know, the job expectancy is 11 months. They don't have a lot of time to get it right. So they would do whatever it takes. I've got no problem with that. That game yesterday is everything we love about our, our industry and our game. And I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, it was great to see. But again, you, you, you know, some people won't. I'm sure like, they'll have the book thrown at them. It's like, fuck, come on. We have the best league in the world. Talking of which, how about Manchester United? Uh, I mean, first of all, hats off to Brentford. I think there's been so much said about Man United without actually saying, wow, to Brentford. No That's credit given to Brentford. Fat, yeah, they're, 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 they're top eight for me this year, Brentford. I love the recruitment they've done. Um, I knew Ivan would do that to United. He's up against a five foot seven midget. The centre half, um, can't say the word midget anymore, the woke police will be after me, um, who's obviously very good, but when you go up against physical players like that in the Premier League, you've got no chance. Um, Ivan was exceptional, two assists, wish he'd yeah. scored. I was you know, going to say, those, it's a shame you don't have an assist clause in that contract. Well, for those laughing about, would Man United buy Ivan Tony? Mm-hmm. They'd be lucky if he, they'd be lucky if he chose to go there, um, you know, at the moment. But would he improve that team the way he plays up? <laughs> Absolutely. You're talking about, what, they're going to spend another £60 million on another foreign or another Dutch striker when you've got one who's played the Premier League for the last year and a half. I, I, I don't know what's going on with the policy. If they've come out with a policy where the manager just wants to recruit Dutch players, you need to be public about that and say so. Because everything right now is about Dutch players. And there's always a worry. You know, the odd Dutch players always done well in the Premier League. But I don't think I could name 15 of them. And to suddenly make your whole recruitment about pretty much from Holland, where you're getting your players, um, you saw it with France with Newcastle a few years ago. It was kind of hit and miss. You've, you know, Spain, Italy. But when everyone's coming from that neck of the woods, and even the one from Barcelona is Dutch because he's had them, uh, I'm concerned. And the other concern you have there is when you have a manager who recruits players just for him, not for a football club, you also have an issue. But that will go into, well, United need to back him and give him time. Look, Man United weren't good enough. They know that. They don't need me. I, I, I'm sick of seeing people, right, you know, basically going in on them. Everyone's going in on them. It's a magnificent football club, one of the biggest in the world. 
they're having a bad moment. As a Liverpool fan, I spent many a year watching us having a bad moment with a couple of highs, you know, Champions League or an FA Cup. Um, they won't have a bad moment forever. It's a bit like I said about Bradford. You know, Man United, they'll finally get it right. Everyone wants to bitch and moan about the owners and the money they take out. And da, da, da. Yeah, you're right. Yes, absolutely. But it's not going to make them sell. If they don't want to sell, they don't want to sell. And by the way, if there's ever a time for them to sell, it's now based off Chelsea being worth, what, three, four billion, which makes Man United worth five or six billion, which means it gives the Glazers a serious pot of gold if they sell. So if there's ever a time they're going to sell, it's now. And if they don't sell in the next few months, guess what, fans? You're probably stuck with them. So I'm not sure what Gary Neville or anyone else who wants to go on about the owners and moving them on and they're entitled to say that is going to make a difference. I just don't see it. You know, I think it's just this, uh, it's not like I've got any, like, I don't care, but Glazers, I think they're just a scapegoat. You know, at the end of the day, it's bad policies, bad signings, wrong kind of players, um, you know, have they invested in the infrastructure while they've spent the money on the players? Maybe they could have actually invested in infrastructure rather than the they, players. They've wasted a lot of money on players. They haven't had a plan for the stadium. You know, even the training ground probably might fall behind where, you know, Tottenham and Chelsea and United and Liverpool, what they're doing there, even Leicester's new training ground. You know, to me, there's always seems to be this, the CEO, there's the technical, there's like five chiefs and there's almost like too many chiefs and not enough Indians, as the saying goes. Um, you know, I've seen the guy who left Liverpool uh, has turned down Chelsea because he wants to have a break. If I were United, I'd be going to him, the ex-sporting director at Liverpool, and saying, hey, have a six-month break. We'll pay you to sit in your arse. But we want you back and we want you here in January. You know, and, and, and really get somebody who's been at a big club and knows how to deal with American ownership and knows how to deal with foreign deals and everything else. So um, that that's where I'd go. You know, I look, look, I mean, I feel sorry for the manager because obviously he's getting it. Um, and it's going to be worse before it gets better. But at the end of the day, when you get a new manager in and you back him with his policy and he wants to go out for those players, unfortunately, there's going to be some short-term pain, you know? And there's a lot of stuff that's rotten to the core in there. Ronaldo should have been moved on two months ago. You know, that should have happened. Yeah, it's like get the drama show the only reason why they're not doing yeah. that. Yeah, stop with the drama. It's, it's every, I'm going to turn on Sky Sports for the transfer show at seven and it's going to be about De Jong from Barcelona two months later. It's going to be about Ronaldo canceling his contract. Why isn't he moved? It's going to be about the recruitment effort. It's going to be about the guy they're trying to get from Juventus and his mother, who's his agent. It's going to be the same old shite. And that goes on for two months. Mm -hmm. And what United need to do is stop all that and start doing their deals in May and June. Get it done. Be done by the first week of July and give the manager the tools, what he needs to get on with his job. Then if he falls short by October, November, January, then you say, look, we're, we're giving him the backing. Arsenal did it for their Teta over two windows. They've spent over 250 million or nearly 300 million. And you're going to see now you know, the dividends from that investment over the last two years from the Cronkies. A fair play for the Cronkies, I think they've lent in 250 million themselves. The argument right. with the Glazers is they don't. The yeah. money only goes one way. Yeah. And that that's not on. So the Glazers, if they're clever, if I'm the Glazers and they're worth it, they should tomorrow come out with a statement and go, we have ring fenced 200 million for the next two windows. And mm -hmm. um, we're not going to get our pants pulled down, even though people know the money we have. We're going to bring the right players in, and we, as a family, are putting that into the club. Yeah, that will buy them twelve months' grace. Yeah, it would. And for them, two hundred million is a drop in the ocean. They own an NFL franchise worth five billion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can afford to borrow two hundred million against their own holdings, but not on the club, on their own personal stuff, and do what the Cronkies have done and loan it into the club. Yeah, just for transfer windows. So, it, look, they have business to do. That the young thing, if they don't get him, it'll just look silly. It's gone on too right. long. It's the same with Sancho last year. That went over yeah. three windows. Other clubs don't go through this. It doesn't go on in the press. United have to learn enough already. If we can't get the young by the end of June, start of July, we're giving them a deadline date and we're moving on to the targets. Is it about um, maybe just paying a little bit more money to get the deal done as opposed to no. just trying to get it for the best no, possible because, deal? Because that, that's, no, I, I don't know if it's about the best possible deal. I think it's down to the players' wages that are owed from Barcelona. And Barcelona think that somebody's going to end up going, okay, we'll give you your 72 million. The players owe to 18 million in wages. We'll meet you halfway. You do nine, we do nine. Barca are trying to nick money by not paying those wages, in my opinion. So at the end of the day, um, if I'm United, 80 million pounds again for a midfielder is too much. It's too much. They need two in there. You see some of the players that have done, they, you know, whatever else, 80 million for that. No, I'm sorry. It's too much. They should have moved on weeks ago. Move on to better targets. You know, there are better players out there. 
Um, you know, save your money and try and get Dalian them done for next year for a hundred million. You know, whatever it needs to be done. But the biggest area they've got is two in midfield they're going to need. You know, and a striker. So Liverpool have the same problem. Next summer we're going to need two in central midfield. So if United you're don't do business against the now, same players. you're going to be fighting. For, you're absolutely right. And and if if Man City lose Bernardo da Silva next year, you're going to have three big clubs yeah. arguing. And there's never more than three or four world class players in those positions. Mm. So. You know, I sympathise with United fans. A good pal of mine in California, Phil, uh, Phil Brown. He has his own podcast, mm-hmm. and um, I can see, I can see his messages like losing his shit. He must have put up twenty messages, and as a fan, I know it hurts, and I know what he's going through. I mean, a Liverpool fan, but for him, it's more serious because it's like his business as well. So he's heartbroken by what he sees, and he probably feels he's nothing he can really do, and there is nothing that can be done. You know, they need better people running the club. Obviously, they need better people that are. You know, I, they need the owners more involved. They need the owners to do what I said. 200, 250 million. Do it now. Do it now. It's going to buy you time. It's going to put everyone quiet and go, hey, the Glazers are putting money into the club. You know, it will do nothing but help the Glazers and they can afford it. Well, moving on to the championship, I wanted to call yep. out Hull. Hull for beating Norwich. Tough start yep. for Norwich. We Dean see, Spitz in trouble there. Yeah, we see he's in trouble United. there. Man United bottom of the uh, Premier League, albeit after two or three games, and Norwich yeah. the same of the Championship. Yeah, um, they've, they've got they've got a side that should be winning the Championship. Um, yeah. You know, Dino's. You know, I've always liked Dean Smith. They're well at Brentford, well at Villa. Um, he needs some results quickly because it's, it'll turn toxic. I've seen it in, on social media. Mm. I'd say if he loses, the, I don't know who they're playing next, but the, the two games this week, if they lose both, he'll be gone by next week. Um, you know, so that's a shame. Um, and I also wanted to call it Coventry, not for their result on um, Saturday, which they lost 3-2 at Millwall, but the stadium. And all yeah, what on earth has gone on, Phil? Right. What on earth is going on? That could derail their season, I tell you, but they haven't had the best starts, have they? And no, and now they're, being, they're talking about having to relay, the, it's, the pitch isn't usable until it's fully relayed. So, yeah, so from what I understand, they rent the stadium, the use of the stadium off the rugby club, correct? It was then yeah. used for the Commonwealth Games, Mm-hmm. Uh, whatever else I don't know enough about the pitch situation to give a serious opinion except to say if I'm that tenant and they cost me my place in the championship because of a bad start or because of whatever else that to me is like a lawsuit waiting to happen yeah they uh, I guess when the, because it was handed over to the uh, organising committee of the Commonwealth Games they didn't get to see it they weren't allowed to see it you know they couldn't see the state of the pitch <coughs> they only saw the state of the pitch when it was handed back um, and when Ooh. it was handed back, it was in a Ooh. non-usable situation, and it seems well, well, like it's getting worse uh, rather well, then than Well, the, the owner of the pitch is going to have to sue the Commonwealth Games, and Coventry mm-hmm. will have to sue the owner of the pitch, I would imagine. But I don't know what's going to happen, but I would imagine there's panic. The good news is the Commonwealth Games have enough deep pockets to put a state-of-the-art pitch in within a week. You know, is that how long is it possible to put to relay a pitch in that short period of time? I think a certain type of pitch it is, yes. I think if you see the pitches now at, like, uh, White Art Lane, you know, which is, has an NFL different pitch that goes on top. I think you would see some of the pitches around the world. Where, where did England play? Where was it England? Where it was a friendly or uh, and there was a pitch laid? Like a week, a champ, no, Champions League final. The Champions oh. League final, yeah. Liverpool played, and they laid the pitch five days before after a concert. So it's definitely possible. It's scientifically possible. I sound like a COVID doctor now. Um, so it's, it's scientifically possible. You don't have to wait the summer for it all to go in and all that. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know. No, no, they can get it done, but it might cost a million quid. Yeah. So if I were to Commonwealth Games, instead of getting a 20 million pound lawsuit from a team that could get, you know, if they had aspirations of getting promoted and it goes the other way because of the start they have, because that championship's unforgiving, well then, yeah, if I were to Commonwealth Committee, whoever makes the decisions, write a check and put a new pitch in for Coventry. Mm-hmm. It is shambolic. And I'm gutted for Coventry because they're so well now. They've operated on the Mark Robbins at another level. They've been brilliant the last couple of years. And for their fans to put up with that shite yeah. after finally getting home is not fair. No, it's out of their control. And do they end up back in Northampton for you know, three shocking. months? Or, um, no, St. Shocking. Andrews or wherever. It's yeah. Well, St. Andrews is falling down, so I don't even think they could go back there. Do you know what I mean? So, well, from what I heard, St. Andrews has got lots of it shut now and um, whatever because of all the work that needs to happen. So into uh, League One, any standout results for you in League One uh, at the weekend? Um, Ipswich obviously had a good result. Um, yeah, 3-0 Brist- against MK Dons. Yeah, Bristol Rovers obviously on the rise after losing their first game. Yeah. Um, anyone else in there that, that, that shocked you? I think Wickham got beaten at home, which shocked me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shrewsbury. Yeah, Shrewsbury obviously, um, who are not a bad side, Shrewsbury. They recruited well. 
Um, tough league. It's a tough league, Phil. I know, you know, our fans, you know, for the ones who are panicking, right? It's a tough league. Like, you're going to lose games of football in this league. And if you're not at it, whatever else. But like I always say, you know, it's a long way to go until it really matters when you, you want to get promoted, as we know. Yeah, and there's a, a cracker at Accrington, far, far. Um, oh, I saw that. Yeah, brilliant. You know what it is about Accrington and put, coming back late? I mean, they keep going and going and going to the end. because Great manager. Down. Great spirit. Yeah. I'll give Coleman his due. He, um, he, he might not be for everybody. But I'll tell you what, him and his staff, the job they do, and they lose their best players every couple of years because they have to, like we do occasionally. And they just have that, uh, that will to win. A little bit like Wickham. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, obviously, good spirit. You know, they know what they're doing. They're, they're good management set up. So, fair play for them. Yeah, that looked like an exciting game. Did you see the Exeter Cheltenham uh, result in the League Cup last week? What was, what was that all about? Did, did S- Cheltenham play a lot of teenagers? I have no idea. I saw the highlights, but I don't know what team they played. 7 0 away, mm. um, which, I mean, obviously stands out. Um, and then come to Saturday, and Exeter get beat by Cambridge. Yeah, but Cambridge are a tough nut, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, you know, they they tend to beat teams that are fancy to beat them. You know, they they they're very resilient, and that didn't surprise me at all. By the way, a friend of mine's like a Cambridge fan out in Spain, and he's like on at me all the time straight away. Oh, we want two, you want two, and it's like I oh, fucking give it a rest, will you? You know. <laughs> so yeah, so looking forward to the to the big derby when we play them. Um, and then if I'm looking into, um, let's see, in League Two, see if there's anything stand out there. Uh, Mansfield have had a slow start, but again, it's only been three games. They lost um, away at Leighton Orient. Yeah, Orient looked good. We played them pre-season. You fancy them, but I still fancy Mansfield. Salford had a good result. Yeah. Um, who else? Stockport up Stockport and running properly. Yeah, they got off the mark finally. Um, nothing it's early. Really, yeah, it's early. It's early. It's like you know, you, you know, everyone was like on to me during the week. I didn't. I didn't even know we were top of the table before we played Plymouth. And I'm just like, who the fuck looks at tables? I know everyone gets excited and whatever else, but like I've always said, I give a fuck about the table until like February onwards. Mm-hmm. You know I mean, like, unless somebody's 20 points ahead, that's the only reason you're looking at the table. But to suddenly, I like, where's Bradford? I wouldn't even know. Yes, I'm sure we're somewhere in the middle. There you go. So you haven't even looked at the table because no. does it really matter? No. And, you know, I think Southampton were top of the Premier League this time a year ago. So <laughs> with all due respect, you know, it's like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. You know, and obviously, I, was, I watched Forrest win yesterday. You know, they're still mm-hmm. doing business. By Jesus, they're doing business. Um, fair play to them. You know, a lot of people are obviously having a go. They're signing too many players, but they needed a squad refresh. They're really using the Premier League to give themselves a platform. I like what they're doing. I like the business they're doing. I think they've got a manager that can cope with that amount of new players. Uh, very resilient yesterday. Yes, they should have lost the game or drawn the game because of the penalty and the different issues. And You know, West Ham. <coughs> but... <clears throat> I think Forrest are going to be difficult to beat at the city ground. Um, you know, and the, and the Greek owners, uh, him and his son, they've mm-hmm. done a good job backing him. You can't say he hasn't spent the money. Um, I mean, Christ, they haven't even got a shirt sponsor. So, you, you, you know, they're really like, they're behind. They're, they've got their convictions and, and they're really behind it. And they're, they're giving the manager every tool he needs. Uh, one of the things that I, I remember when that I heard this week, again, it was in that BBC podcast, was Tony Stewart, the uh, Rotherham chairman. And he was actually talking about investments, you know, and Rotherham's kind of gone up and they've gone down and been that little bit of a yo-yo club. Yeah. You know, he was talking about the fact that there's investment that's there, but he's not willing to put the investment in until they've consolidated as a as I a understand where team. Tony's coming from. Listen, they had a great result the weekend. They yeah, they did. That was a standout result in the champ, yeah. by the way. So apology, Rotherham fans. But look, I back Tony. I understand what he's saying. When you're a yo-yo club and we've been in that situation, that vacuum, you're frightened. You are. You're timid. Because if you go hell for leather and you spend the money and it goes wrong, you're fucking in League One and you could go out of business or you can put yourself under serious pressure. So no Rotherham fan will criticize him for his policy because until they're there two, three, you want to be in the champ two, three years. So you're stuck between a rock and a hard place because if you mm-hmm. go for it, it backfires, you're fucked. If you go yeah. for it and it goes well, you're there for three, four, five, six, seven years. But it's years. a gamble. Right. It's a big but it's gamble, a gamble. isn't it? I remember a few years ago, um, my friend who owns Huddersfield, um, he put 11 million in. And he, mm-hmm. uh, they'd been in the champ two years. And he had a go. And they brought in foreign players that a German manager. Were, and they got promoted and it paid yeah. off. And it was wonderful. Dean Hoyle. And fair play, you got balls the size of melons making that decision. But I guess if you're worth half a billion, you know, spending 10 or 11 million downside? externally, what's the downside? Yeah, but it's worth it, you know. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I admire, like we always have a go in League One. I admire any owner. Who, who does it, but I am totally in Tony Stewart's corner that 
you know, for him to suddenly go out and start paying eight, nine, ten grand a week and splurging money on fees, it, it's dangerous, Phil. It's really dangerous. And Rotherham are just a well-run football club. He always knows, Tom, that they go down, there's a 90% chance they come back up. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, yeah, it's the long game. It's the long game. It's going to take time. Um, and I want to go all the way down to National League North, just to call yes. a couple of clubs there, um, because both of them got promoted um, to National League North. Uh, yep. One that's, uh, that I'm enjoying kind of seeing the rise of, and one which is probably more interesting for you. Uh, so I'll call it Peterborough Sports. Yes. Um, to start with. And yes. They had a great win at the weekend, 3 0 away at Southport. You know, yep. Everyone said, oh, they're going to get relegated much as no, they no, 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 Scarborough, no, no. which is the one no. that I'm following. They, they've got a manager, Jimmy Dean, who's as good as any manager in non league. And I'm, I'm surprised he's still there. And I, I'm not trying to, you know, see other clubs steal him or whatever else. But, you know, from speaking with people in my club who know him, he builds a real camaraderie uh, amongst under, underdogs. And the rise they've had under him, he is so successful at what he does. It's only a matter of time before somebody in the conference above, or maybe the bottom of the league too, has a go and tries to get him. Because I don't think he's even full-time and look at the job he's doing. Right. So he, he's got, he's got, you know, he could end up managing a lot higher. And I am not surprised they're doing well. And I think they'll have a really good season. For those who think they're going to struggle, you know, I know the owners are trying to give them financial support. Some friends of mine, you know, uh, Jean Venters, her son, yep. works at the club. Yep. Um, so I, I'm always, like, happy to see them do well, and I want them to do well. Um, and I just want to call out Scarborough Athletic as well, another club. It's great to see them back. Exactly. You know, they were um... – we have some connection with them all the way back in the 90s. We actually had an yeah. owner swap where um, our owner went to uh, Scarborough and Scarborough's owner was Jeffrey Richmond, who then bought us um, and brought Sean Harvey along for the ride. And Sean went on to do a variety of different things. There you um, go. But I've always been interested in, you know, they had, they sold the ground, <coughs> you know, bulldozed for houses, the club disappeared. Um, and I think it's just a great story to see them uh, starting to rise back up through the pyramid again. Who owns them now? Uh, to be honest with you, I have no idea. The other one so, I saw was, was Dorking Wanderers. Is it Dorking Wanderers? Who've had like 10 promotions in 20 years. They're now in like... Sure. Is Dorking are they in the South? Yeah. No. National, are they, oh, is that where they are? They're in the That's conference. Yeah. Dorking. I mean, they've really Dorking like... Wanderers. I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it it is. Yeah, they've had like eleven promotions in twenty two years or something like a phenomenal rise. Look, that's right. Everyone, they played. Uh, they played Oldham at the weekend. They lost three two yeah, to Oldham. Yeah, that's that's right with the new Oldham owner. So anytime you see stories, like, everyone loves a fairy tale. That's what the pyramid's all about. It's what we moan about American and the MLS system not having the pyramid. It's it's what fairy tales are. It's what makes our football pyramid the thing it is of beauty mm -hmm. and the best one in the world. All right, let me go and have a look at. Um, a couple of questions um, and um, other topics that we've got coming through. So uh, one thing is actually on Birmingham, and this is something I made a note of last week, didn't get to ask you. Um, apparently, they the, the folks who want to take over Birmingham paid a million and a half deposit without the rest of the funds in place yet. Is that how you, things usually work? Like you're buying for exclusivity, and then you got to go and find the money to, uh, to consummate the deal. No, when I did my deal, um, when I sold my shares, we obviously I needed to see proof of funds. Then we went through an MOU. Then we went through an official process. My partners had to get clearance from the EFL, pass all the tests. And then we had a co closing date where money exchanged hands then. So I never got a deposit. Um, I guess it's the way you do it. But I would imagine the money would go to escrow, you know, to pay a deposit to another club. Unless, as you said, there's an exclusivity period. It's It just depends on the deal. Now, if they've paid a million and a half for the Asian owners of Birmingham, and there's a, there's a date to close, and you don't close, you're going to lose your deposit. So I, I don't know the ins and outs of the deal. I saw the thing on Sky a couple of weeks ago, you know, about the guy from Gymshark and, and then the ex-footballer, I forget who he was, um, who was the, the player involved. Um, and there was a whole thing about it, and it's all died down. So I, 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 I don't know what, what's going on there. I, I really don't. I, I read about the complications of ownership and the, the stock exchange and the situation where they can't buy the rest of the shares yet. But it just seems a really, really complicated situation. How much do the EFL scrutinize source of funds when they're looking at Yeah, I, I, I think nowadays they have to. And I think because of Russia and sanctions and everything else, I think they have to be careful. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the EFL now, I think you learn as you go along. And I think they've been previously criticized for letting certain owners in. 
And I think they've learned from that. And under the, the, the stewardship of Rick Parry and co, I think it's a lot more difficult for rogue idiots to try and get involved in football. I think it's impossible. And that's only right. We don't want idiots and rogue idiots getting involved in buying football clubs. And by the way, I'm not saying that about the Birmingham owners. I'm just saying that as a as an overview. Protecting the clubs from you know, Correct. Who, who is able to buy a club. Correct. So it's, it's not that difficult nowadays to show source of funds, you know, to show that, hey, it didn't come from Putin's secret stash or it didn't come from Iran's nuclear collection or it didn't come from wherever. So, yeah. And then at Barnsley, Barnsley agreed a, a deal, shirt sponsor deal with a crypto company, Hex.com, just before right. the season. And then there was a bunch of offensive tweets, I guess, from the owner of that company, um, which led the club to cancel the deal. Um, you know, do you, how much, how much due diligence should a club do on its sponsors um, as they're yeah, looking uh, at you know, uh, who's going to be put on the front of the shirt? I guess, look, like I said earlier, in the, in the, in the time of outrage over everything, I'm sure... You know, every sponsor you have, you could probably find something they've done, you know, in the last period. I, I don't, I'm not privy to what were the, the messages the owner of the currency company did. I, I don't know what he said. I don't know. Were they racist? Were they sexist? Were they misogynistic is the word everyone likes to use? I don't know. Uh, at the end of the day, no. Did we do due diligence into Western Homes and whatever else? No. Um, you know, we're, we're a business. Um, you know, the guy's never been found guilty for any crimes. He's not murdered anyone. Uh, his money's as good as anybody's. Um, I don't know. Maybe, you know, in the current woke times we live in, I should have to hire PIs to do social media searches and everybody involved with our sponsorship. But I think 99% of people nowadays will have some shit on their social media from way back when. Um, and I did want to bring up, I know that uh, you've talked on the pod before that you're not the uh, uh, the greatest of friends, that's fair to say, but Paul Scally at Gillingham announced mm. uh, that he's going to be stepping back after uh, what he called extreme personal abuse. I um, saw that, yeah. And I guess just your thoughts on, you know, how well, it being that bad that that's, you feel like that's... Yeah, I, 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 look, there's no, you know, there's no hiding. I'm not overly fond of him and, and he wouldn't be overly fond of me. No owner should get that kind of abuse. No owner should feel threatened. No owner should feel depressed. No owner should be forced to leave their club, you know, under any circumstances. So I don't like hearing that. The guy's been around a long time, 27 years or whatever it is. Um, they've had a lot more success at Gillian than than failure. I think sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for. He's a human being. He's not perfect. He's not Mr. Moneybags. So you can only put his own blood, sweat and tears into the club. If it's not good enough, you hold your hands up. I would say to him, take a rest for a few months and revisit. I know he loves his football. Um, and even though I'm not overly fond of him, I wouldn't want to see that happen to him. So, you know, of course, we at the Hard Truth Pod send our best to him. And we send our worst to the people who have vilified him and forced him out. Because right. that, that's not deserved. At the end of the day, you know, most of the owners, like you say, he's not coming in, as, as many owners are not coming in with these hundreds of millions of pounds no. that they can go and no. spend on a football club. They're being custodians and stewards well, of a club you be trying careful. to help them grow. But, you got to be careful because, you know, the Ogilarks and the Hollywood celebrities and, you know, the state governments and all these people buying clubs and uh, hedge funds and everything else, you know, it's okay to have a few British owners or Irish owners. It's okay to have a few normal owners, you know, who aren't these billionaires. It's okay to have people who are a bit like yourself, you know, normal people who, who, who are fortunate enough to buy a club and want to live the dream because otherwise we're going to become a faceless league. Otherwise, there's no personalities left. Otherwise, it's just chief executives you're going to be dealing with all the time. And you're not going to get access to owners. And you're not going to get access to humans. Um, and that's no disrespect to the states who bought clubs or to the hedge funds no, who bought or the Argolars. It's just corporate, it's corporations versus corporations. It, 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 it is. And I'm, look, I've run a corporate business. And I've been corporate with my suit and tie on and everything else. But I still like the posh fans to feel you know, owning the football club and my partners probably feel the same, that we're humans, we're normal, we're, we'll have a beer with you, we'll have a chat with you and, you know, you can get to see us anytime or talk to us anytime. Suddenly you go away from that and everything's just a front with a technical director and a CEO and a CEO and, you, you know, you lose that. And I think for family football clubs, it's really important to have some sort of an identity or a, an affiliation with your owner. So I hope it doesn't change. Yeah, you know, it's... Um 
as a lower league club, I talk a lot about soul. You know, you want to feel like you understand the soul of the club and that you're aligned yeah. with how it thinks. And yeah. because you're not, and you, you're, you, you're not going to watch a club to win every week. No, you're but associated you're, with some. You're absolutely right. You mentioned there, like Tony Stewart. You know, he's another owner who's like a face, and you know, somebody like he's been in office having a cigar and a bit of crack. And you know, if Rotherham were to be bought by, I don't know, a hedge fund or whatever else, you know, I, I, me and Barry would miss that banter in a direction and. You know, you get other owners who are like that, and you enjoy their company, and you you know what I mean. And like the Wickham owners, you got I believe it's an American and his his nephew who operate the club. And whilst they're very successful away from the club, they're like probably British and Irish owners. They're there, they're involved, they're on match day involved, and you know they're happy to chat and talk. And you you, you know they're the kind of foreign owners you want, you know, and 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 who have an imprint and a and a vision, or who have an affiliation with the fans and want to have a beer with them and get to know them and. You know, and whilst they might be loaded and rich, they're still normal people. So that that's that's what you want. So I've got some questions. One from Paul sure. C that came on Twitter. Um, after Ryan Lowe said that Preston don't sign and not no beds. No beds. <laughs> how important is it not to sign them? Um, yeah. you know, how do you research uh, to make sure the character of a player is somebody who you want to fit in the dressing room? You got you gotta love Lowe. He's very good. He says it how it is. It's very difficult. We've had no beds. We've signed no mm -hmm. beds, unfortunately. It's not a perfect science. Sometimes there are players who are young who are knobheads that you think there's so much talent in there, you can grow the knobhead out of them. Yeah. You know, I spoke about it. Lee Tomlin was a knobhead when yeah. we signed him as he was young. But we thought, okay, you know, you can. he's a lovable knobhead. And I mean that he's listening. I don't want him to feel hurt by me saying that. So we can, we can get the best out of him and help him grow. And we did. You know, so you, you pick up players like that all the time. And they've been discarded for a reason. And you want to get them going again. So I understand this policy. I don't necessarily agree 100% with it because you want to find that gem and the unpolished diamond. And they're only out there because maybe they do have a bit of knobhead about them. Now, are the clubs that don't care at all and will just sign anybody? Uh, or is the... Yeah, there's managers know, who are desperate for players, Phil. Yeah. There are managers who would basically cut their finger off to get anyone in the building. They'd probably sign a serial killer if he could score 20 goals. You, mm -hmm. you, you know, that is the will to win sometimes yeah. in football. So yes is the answer to that. Because it's like if every if every club, because it's, you know, um, from a mental model perspective, it's the right thing to do to make sure you've got the right characters in the dressing room. If every single club operated like that, uh, it becomes, you know, if that's your attitude, you're never going to get a football club no matter what your technical uh, uh, Phil, I, I was fired when I was 22, 23 in my first real estate job. Mm -hmm. I was brilliant at what I did. I was like a striker that would win a golden boot, but I was a knobhead. And they fired me for being a knobhead. People yeah. will say I'm still a knobhead. But I grew up, you know, mm. a year later, I'm, I went and I hired lots of young knobheads that I could, you know, help convert. So, no, I, I don't buy into the theory that you don't, you know, I, I just think, and by the way, we all at the best of times can act like knobheads. Right. And that includes Lowy, by the way, even though mm. I like him. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Steve asks, um, he's got a couple of questions. I'm just going to ask you uh, one of those. Um would you say it's more pertinent to develop David uh, Ajiboye, Joe Taylor, and Hector Kiprianu at League One level than bringing them in at a championship level? Like, does League One help their development? The fact yes. that where you are. Yes, yes. Now, if we've been in the champ like last year, they've gone in maybe to the 23s, mm -hmm. like Poku did at the start. And then you, you they catch up halfway through. So, but yes, it helps if they play a lot of games in League One and they're at the right age, you think they can they can develop and get better. Now, if you're looking at young talent and you're in the championship, you're not in League One, mm -hmm. are you looking at different talent with a higher ceiling? Yes. Or are you looking and saying, you know what, these guys who were in League Two and they did it, uh, they're not ready for the championship, but I think the ceiling is high that I just might need a couple more years to get them to that level. Yeah, in the championship, we're not shopping as low as usual, like non-league or whatever else. We're very careful because the step up is three levels. is difficult. It's a real one and 10 situation. If you think there's definitely ability, you put them in your 23s, you put them out on loan, you, you go down that route. You know, the champ, you're know, you also looking at, there's a lot more goes into the physicality for the champ. Like I know, we go back to the champ, I start going down my scouting list, physicality is going to be a big part of it. Not just technical ability, not just attitude, but where are they physically? Like some players weren't physically ready for the champ. So is this player physically ready? You know, like, I sign a centre half in the championship. I promise you this: they'll all be six foot four onwards, upwards. Mm -hmm. Hundred percent. So let's uh, let's call it quits for another week. All right, cool. Um, 
good luck with your two games this week. And um, you guys, and you guys, keep it going. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully we can do the business at home. Big games coming up. So to the football fans out there, thanks for your support. Keep moving the needle. Keep following yeah, and uh, just a reminder, you can watch every episode on YouTube as well. Just search Hard Truth Podcast. You can subscribe there. Uh, we also just uh, keep a look on any comments. If you've got comments and questions, you can always uh, pop it in there. Uh, any questions, please continue to send them over, hardtruthfootball.com slash contact. Um, DM us on, on Twitter. We pull it all together um, in the same place. Also a reminder, if you haven't rated us uh, through your podcast provider, please do that because that's one of the ways that helps us um, you know, kind of spread the word and get more eyes and ears um, on the podcast. Um, Thanks, guys. So with that being said, we uh, good luck to all of your teams this week, unless you're playing Bradford or uh, Peterborough. And, uh, <laughs> and we'll talk to you again next week.